Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. How are you doing? How are you, RFM? I'm fine, thank you very much, Bill. How are you? Excellent. What a what a great fun time it is. Wednesdays at six twenty Mountain Time, uh, five twenty, where you're at, right, my friend? An hour back. I can neither confirm nor de- deny the time zone that I inhabit, but it's my favorite night of the week, regardless of the time. There you go. Uh, let's see. Anything in terms of announcements going in, going on, on your end? Well, I'm going to be going to Sunstone. Look at that. Presenting on that DNC 132. Yes, and the affidavits that are contained in the pages of the Nauvoo Expositor. Yeah, that should be a lot of fun. I'm excited to, to hear that you're doing that. You know what I like about the Nauvoo Expositor? What's that? I don't have to remember which issue. No, just one. You just There's only one. issue. Four pages. Yeah. Yes, but those are big pages. They are. There's a lot in there. Yeah. And like six columns, it took it took me like two hours, probably three hours to read this newspaper. You read There's the whole so much thing? material. I read the whole thing. Yes, I may do an RFM episode just about a little breakdown of the Nauvoo Expositor. Did they have any cool advertisements in there for? Yes, yeah, penmanship was mm. a big deal. So trying to learn how to write appropriately, and I think there were at least. Two people, or at least two ads, I know. Um, I think it was two people advertising to help people with their penmanship. Mm, awesome, yeah, super cool. Um, yeah, it was the uh, that was the going thing back then for a day. Was the Nauvoo Expositor pretty much just a one day in and out, boom bang? Yeah, it was it. <laughs> um, I will say, folks, uh, if you in the comments, uh, every show Maven is sharing. Uh, links to the merchandise, links to sign up for the mailing list. We don't try to overwhelm you with that, but once every month or two, uh, we'll send something out. And also, after if you're watching the show not live, down below the video, if you open up the details of the show, there will be that information in there uh, as well. And there's lots of other good information in, in terms of where you can find our content and uh, how you can contact us if you have any questions. Please leave a comment. Uh, like, hit the like button, subscribe. We like all those things. But today, do you have anything else for us, by the way, before I jump into it? No, but we're going to have a great, great discussion today about Mormon history. Um, one could even say that Mormonism Live is your best source. I think for, so. For Mormon history. In I know other people. Of what? Probably some science and theology, too. I think it is the best source for <laughs> Mormon history, science, and theology, regardless of what others claim. They're number two. I'm not sure they try harder. But they're just number two, all the way around. Any way you look at it, it's number two. However, however, see, I got you off here. You're already laughing. I love People it. are going to love this episode. Here, where Mormon history comes to life, courtesy yeah. of Bill Real. So what we've got is uh, a story that I've known ever since pretty much the beginning of when I was in the church. I read and learned about this story early on in my time in the church, and I had sort of remembered the primary details, but I thought it'd be fun to go back and see if I could find a few things. Uh, and, and you've got a, a few things that'll kind of come along here along the way as well that I thought were interesting as you and I talked today. Uh, I titled this one Mormon to Millionaire, Sam Brannan and the Brooklyn. Uh, so here we are, Mormonism Live, and we'll go into a little bit of history. Samuel Brannan was born on the 2nd of March, 1819 uh, in then Massachusetts. We were just talking before the show, but This part of Massachusetts became what is today Seiko, Maine. Uh, So it kind of switched teams there right in the middle of the game or so, you know? Yeah, I I had not been aware. I must have been asleep at that part of American history in high school or something. That that Massachusetts used to be a lot bigger and go all the way up into Maine. Yeah, kind of crazy. Yeah. Um, Brandon had an abusive father and uh, he ends up moving out with his sister who's older. She's married. 
and they moved to Painesville, Ohio when Brannon is 14. By the way, these are not real pictures of Samuel Brannon over here. Those are an AI art generator that took the photos we do have of Samuel Brannon and it predicted what Brannon would have looked like other than, you know, and again, abusive father, so he doesn't look very happy. But other than the facial expressions being for sure, this is uh, the AI art generator's replica of what Samuel Brannon would have looked like at a younger age. The bottom photo reminds me of Horatio Alger, and the top photo reminds me of Billy Mummy in a Twilight Zone episode. <laughs> there you go. You're really good at that, by the way. You see a face and you know instantly some person from the past that that uh, has a similar look to. But yes, Horatio Alger. And who's the top one again? Billy Mummy. Right now Billy? he's threatening to send you into the cornfield. Maven, you, sometime here in the beginning, pull up a picture of those two. Billy Mummy. And, well, Horatio uh, Alger is a fictional character, so it would be an artist's rendition anyway. But let's see how close it is, because you envisioned him in, a, in your head, and other folks have depicted him in art. Let's see what happens with Horatio Alger. Um, Brannon, when he's 14 years old, they go to Painesville, Ohio. And in Painesville, Brannon learns the printer's trade. And this sort of comes up later in how Brannon uh, makes his way in the world at various points. But he learned the printer's trade in Painesville as, uh, as an older teenager, young adult. Uh, there was so an important there's... newspaper there, wasn't there, in Painesville, Ohio? The uh, Telegraph? The Telegraph. Yeah, that, that carries a lot of church history in it, and we've mm -hmm. used that in past episodes. Yes. Awesome. Uh, so, uh, while traveling to Ohio, the trio encountered Orson Hyde in Heber C. Kimball. Uh, they got to know these folks, uh, obviously early leaders in the LDS Church. Uh, Brandon's brother-in-law ended up buying, uh, purchasing a Book of Mormon. You... You and I both know that not a lot of those sold. They didn't clear those out right away, that first edition, uh, for $1.75 or whatever they were selling those for. But, but uh, I Brandon's think there were, brother, were there 5000 in the first edition? Yeah, because uh, was it Martin Harris loaned out $3,000 to print 5,000 books? That's my recollection. Yeah, I think the, I think the first price was $1.75, and then eventually Mormonism learned that the only way you can get people to read the book is if you give it out for free. Yes. <laughs> so... Uh, so they, uh, the family meets Orson Hyde, Heber C. Kimball. They get to know him. Uh, bro Brandon's brother-in-law purchases a book of Mormon. And by 1842, in the nearby town that we all know as Kirtland, Ohio, Brandon and uh, Alexander and Marianne, his uh, sister and brother-in-law, all become members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Hmm. Alexander uh, and Marianne. Gilligan's Island. You got it, baby. You got it. Huh. Stop the presses. Look at that. Look at stop. And talking about presses, RFM. Nice following segue, Bill. Father's, following his father's passing, Brandon inherited a substantial sum. He, sum. he used this to buy himself out of the last year of his apprenticeship. Uh, he ended up buying, taking the rest of the money he had left, bought a small piece of land in Kirt or no, Cleveland, Ohio, just outside of Kirtland. And, uh, but the market crashed, rendering his land worthless. Now, still have land. In my mind, you just hang on to it, and eventually land tends to go back up in price again. But uh, he abandoned it. And then he went to go visit his ailing mother in Maine. They proceeded to uh, New Orleans to join his brother Thomas. And then Thomas and him there purchased a printing press. Okay, wait. He then, he then visited his ailing mother in Maine. Yes, he visited his ailing mother in Saco, Maine. Not Old in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. <laughs> <laughs> By this time, it looks like it's, uh, it's changed over. It is very confusing. I'm glad I, I'm, I'm not from that area. Massachusetts becomes Seiko, Maine, or at least part of Massachusetts becomes Seiko, Maine. Uh, but uh, Samuel Brannon and his brother buy a printing press. They're going to start their own newspaper. The problem is Brannon's brother falls ill to yellow fever, and uh, I believe he dies, although it didn't say that in the article. I tried to find that and didn't see it. Hmm. Uh, but after the heartbreaking event, Brannon headed back north, briefly stopping in Indianapolis to promote that newspaper he was going to do, but it turned out to be unsuccessful, and he eventually returns to his sister in Painesville, Ohio. So there he's called on a mission by Apostle Wilford Woodruff to serve a local mission in Ohio. So local missions, like we used to, we think that the way the church has always done this is to send people out into the field, and that local missions are sort of a modern thing that the Mormon church has done. But here is Char or here is Samuel Brannon not trusted enough to go too far, and they keep him close to home. Um, Did Joseph Smith send people on missions really far away 
if he was interested in their wives? Uh, really far away. Sometimes those weren't local like missions. Jerusalem, yeah. Yeah, those were not ward missionaries. No, those aren't ward missionaries. Like okay. Lucy Walker's dad or uh, Orson Hyde, uh, they got sent a little further away. But uh, Apostle Wilford Woodruff calls Samuel Brannon to serve a local mission in Ohio. Uh, he's also at this point he marries a, a Harriet Hattie Hatch is is what she goes by Hattie. And they're expecting their first child. Brandon accepts the mission call, but his mission is cut short due to malaria. And so he ends up just uh, returning home. So he must have been working in the next county or two over and comes home after he uh, suffers from malaria. Uh, but Brandon received another church assignment as a printer. Again, this is his skill set. So this is what he's being used for in Connecticut. And he gets to work alongside Joseph Smith's brother, the Apostle William Smith. Uh, who Joseph used to get into fights in the Kirtland Temple with, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, and I think Connecticut used to be a part of Florida. <laughs> it might have been. <laughs> uh, th that early United States, you know, everything's in motion, everything's fluid. Ebb and flow to the building of a country, you know what I mean? <laughs> so uh, during this time, though, there's a strange thing happens. He falls in love with another woman, Anne Eliza Corwin. Wait, he's still he, married to Hattie? He's still married to Hattie. Falls in love with another lady. He's in the right religion for this kind of stuff, though, you know? <laughs> and from St. Maine, right? That's where the Cochranites were having their heyday, I believe. Yeah. Oh, look at that. That would be an interesting little connection, huh? Um, he falls in love with her. He eventually weds this second woman, although it's rumored, and I couldn't find any details on this, but it was rumored that he had not officially divorced his first wife. So together, him and his new bride, they moved to New York City in 1844, and they begin publishing The Prophet, later The New York Messenger, a Latter-day Saint newspaper. And when they hear of uh, Joseph Smith and Hiram Smith's death, Brannon and William Smith uh, get together and propose that William should take up the role of prophet. And that led to Brannon and William Smith's, by the way, but Brannon's disfellowshipment from the church. But Brannon, uh, about a year later, um, reaches back out to the brethren. He apologizes, asks to have his membership restored. And in May of 1845, he is brought back into the church. I and love this picture. Yeah, this is also AI art. I uh, There is no existing photo of the ship that Brannon led. So Brannon is the highest ranking leader in the church in the East. And even though he was just, uh, what, let's go back to the previous slide here. Let me just double check this. Even though he was just as fellowshipped and brought back into the church, they still trusted him with because he is the highest ranking leader to be the one who is responsible to bring all the Eastern saints to Zion. And by this time, Brigham Young is uh, preparing everybody to move west to uh, out west and eventually becomes you know Utah that they select. But they haven't picked their place yet. And I was talking to you about this uh, as we were preparing for this episode. We like to think in our heads as Mormons that Joseph Smith uh, gave a prophecy or that Brigham Young follows up and that it's always known that they're going to end up somewhere around the Great Salt Lake. In the Rocky but, Mountains. Right. But in reality, they were sending people in lots of places. Uh, Brandon here is given the assignment to take the, sen the saints to the New Zion in California. Mm -hmm. And then you had mentioned one as well. Yeah, Texas. Yeah. Was that and McClellan? So Mm -hmm. I don't or know Lyman. if it's I can't remember. It's one of the apostles, and they got sent yeah. down to Texas to scout so it out, see if that would be a good place. Yeah, so there are several geographic locations that the church leadership were considering in terms of moving away from Nauvoo and taking the saints to somewhere else in the West. All right, so um, – oh, go ahead. You know what this picture makes me think of? Uh, I don't know. What is it? All I ask – is a tall ship and a star to sail her by or steer her by, I think it is. Is that Pirates of the Caribbean with Johnny Depp? I'm guessing it's Robert Louis Stevenson, but that's a guess on my part. The audience can look <laughs> it up and correct me. So, but we know it's not Johnny Depp. And Pirates I'm pretty sure it's not Johnny Depp, no. I think it got repeated Black by Pearl. William Shatner in one of the Star Trek movies, though. <laughs> there you go. That's where I learned it. <laughs> what does God need with a, with a starship? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so uh, Brandon being the highest ranking leader, he's given the responsibility to take the Eastern Saints West, and they are to board a ship, the Brooklyn. Brandon's in charge of securing the ship, uh, leasing it, making the arrangements, and he convinces the New York Mormons as well as some of the other saints out in the East to join the journey uh, to California. 
The ship set sail in 1846. It was advertised to the Saints as a first-class ship in the best order for sea, a very fast sailor. And that actually shows up in the church magazine, Times and Seasons, 1 February 1846, which we'll we'll look at a couple of these uh, issues in a moment. But uh, when the folks that actually rode on the ship reported it as an old and almost worn out, one of the <laughs> old one of the old time build made more for work than beauty with unmistakable signs of weakness and decay. <laughs> you talk about a false bill of goods. It's really important when you get on a boat that it floats and looks like it's going to float. <laughs> you need to check under the hood before you buy one of these babies. <laughs> so there's that. The ship wasn't as in as good a shape as it was advertised. That's beautiful. No, the AI art generator produced some very beautiful art. We'll see a few more on the way. Cost of transportation. So he leased the Brooklyn for $1,200 per month. And Brannon then arranged for passengers to prepay their fares of $75 per adult and half of that for children to cover the main cost. And then the only thing that would have been separate would have been the port fees uh, when they stopped at places. Uh, sea Fever by John Massfield. I must go down to the seas again, to the lonely sea in, sky, in the sky, and all I ask is a tall ship and a star to steer her by. Thank Rainy you so much, Rainy April. Sea Fever by John Massfield. Mm, pretty cool. All right, so uh, here's the additions. We won't read these. It's just the church in its periodical, uh, Times and Seasons, telling the members in Nauvoo that... Uh, that this ship is taking off in the first issue and has taken off in the second one and essentially just reporting what the Saints Back East are doing. It does give the rules, which we'll place in another spot here, and we'll go over those. But there was the first edition which announced it, and here's the, uh, I think this was the 15th of February, um, 1848, if I'm not mistaken. 48? And, yeah, I think so. And this was... Uh, this 46? was. No, 46, sorry. This was the edition that was showing that they had actually left port already and that they had celebrated leaving the waters and everybody was up on board and cheering and all that kind of stuff. And this is right at the same time, isn't it, that the Mormons are sending their first and very large group of people across the frozen Mississippi and Iowa? Yeah, this is all, all these movements seem to be going on about the same time, right? I think that's correct. Mm -hmm. So ship preparations, they, uh, they turned this merchantman ship into a passenger ship by adding 32 small staterooms with bunks, vents, and skylights for ventilation and light. They built a long table with benches for meetings and meals, but space was so limited that it necessitated that the taller passengers needed to stoop between decks. The galley on the deck was improved to cook for 400 people. They had ample fresh water from Croton Lake. How, how fresh do you think the water from Croton Lake is? I... I you imagine know. it was fresh. It's probably fresher than the name of the lake would indicate. I would hope so. Oh, man. I'll tell you this, too. I mean, I'm, I get used to drinking water out of the tap, which they say isn't good for you. But uh, drinking yeah. fresh water from, you know, the lake, it doesn't seem like that's going to be the best thing to, to take. Hopefully they boiled that every time. Otherwise, they'd be straining the worms out of the water with their teeth when they took a drink. Yeah, and we'll get to it later. They actually do have to strain the water at, at a point when things... I'm sorry. Really I'm so sorry. I got ahead. I was wondering, no, where no, did no. that come from? <laughs> well, it's from the research you've been doing. That's right. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right. So they uh, other things they had, provisions for six to seven months, crates of chickens, 40 to 50 pigs, two milch cows. And I went and checked the spelling on that because I'd yep. never heard that word before. Mm -hmm. But a milch cow is a milk cow. That's ja, wohl, mein Herr. Look at that. Milch. Two Two milk, milch cows. Milk. Milk. It's German for milk. It's where you get the word. Yeah, we're, we're even stationed on board, and I think that means pinned up, if I'm not mistaken. I um, hope so. Yeah. Before, Otherwise, they'd just it, be roaming everywhere. It reminds me a little bit of, like, Nephi's ship or the Jaredites, and you put all these things on board, and there's a lot of care that goes into keeping animals alive for a long trip and cleaning up after them. But this was a, this was a big ship that was not tight onto a dish. Well, yeah, very good point. And like Rebecca says, they really had to stay in this boat. <laughs> they did. But, but when you've got animals for purposes of, a, not, like, not that I've ever done this or outfitted a ship or anything, but yeah, those animals, you take very good care of those animals because your life depends upon them. Yeah, totally. Uh, and then the kind of a weird little fact, before departure, 
uh, Joshua M. Van Cott, who was a local person from where the boat took off, I believe, gifted the young voyage or gift, sorry, gifted the voyagers 179 volumes of the Harper family library during a farewell party. And there's multiple reports of the Mormons aboard the ship for their entertainment. One of the few things they had was to read mm. these books. And so it actually turned out to be a really cool gift to give this, uh, this parting, uh, group as they take off for a long journey. If nothing else, I'm sure it served as good ballast. Yeah. <laughs> it was the first thing to go overboard in a storm. Uh, we'll find out. There were other things that went overboard, unfortunately. So, uh oh, yeah. Uh oh, they, this looks like a, a stormy picture. Yeah. So here's another AI art. This is uh, they encountered several storms, and both of these storms, the main ones, the, the two big storms, come as they're trying to make their way to to the first port to restock supplies, and because these storms were so bad. They couldn't get to port on the day they wanted to. And because of the second storm, they actually had to reroute themselves and head to a completely different port hundreds of miles away. And so these storms really threw a wrench in their ability uh, uh, to get back to land and to resupply because you don't take enough stuff to get to your end destination. You take enough stuff to get you to uh, your first stop. And there you replenish. Um, now, by the way, they're going from, was it New York? City, New is York, that where they yeah. were going? Mm -hmm. And they're traveling to where? They are traveling to, they actually uh, end up changing their final destination, but where they end up is uh, in present day San Francisco. But okay. I forget what the name of it is. We'll see it later, but it's called something else at the time because it's under Mexican rule. And Was uh, it Yorba Linda? No, no, that's a real place now. Uh, yeah. Buena? Yorba yeah, it's Buena, it's Yerba, Yerba Buena, Yerba or Buena. Like that. Yep. And uh, so, did they bringing... go through the Panama Canal, Bill? Yeah, I don't, I don't know that. No, they didn't, because yeah. there was no Panama Canal at right. the time. That was supposed <laughs> to be a. <laughs> okay, no, they had to go all the way down under the Cape of. Oh, what is the Cape Canaveral. down there? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's the Cape at the bottom of South? It's Good Hope on Africa, right? Yeah, and that actually go ahead. Anyway. Oh jeez. Come on, I'll look know. it up. But but look this is up. a massively long voyage. It is. It's In like 3,000 miles it's... to get from New York to San Francisco, present day San Francisco around 3,000 yeah. miles, but you have got to go Cape Horn. That's what it is. Cape Horn. It, it Thank is, you, Doug Vincent. There was a mention of it being the longest U.S. voyage at the time to go from New York on the ship to all the way around to California. Because yeah, um, you have to practically go down to freaking Antarctica because that's what you're going in between Antarctica and the very southern tip of South America. And that's very, very dangerous because it's a narrow passageway, relatively narrow. And you've got all the ocean passing through there. So it ends up becoming very quick currents, it can be very violent, and it takes a master captain to get you through safely. And if you remember, Brigham Young wants to move the Saints outside of the United States. So yes. part of this is when they end up in Utah, that's outside the U.S., even though I think it might be a U.S. territory, it's not a U.S. state yet. And then as it was actually their, in Mexico. Okay. And then they as, got they're there, the, as they're territory. making their way to California, it's also Mexican territory at the time, which Brigham yeah. Young wants it to be so they can get outside of U.S. jurisdiction. Hmm. Um, but that kind of plays out in how this story sort of unfolds as well, uh, because this is right at the time of the Mexican-American War uh, going oh, on. Oh, yeah. It too. went from 1846 to 1848, I believe. Yep. So the ship routines, a uh, strict schedule is maintained, starting with, uh, I think it's called, is it Revel? Reveille. Yeah. And is that where they blow the trumpet and everybody gets up or something, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yes. And then a followed by designated times for cleaning, eating, counting the sick, engaging in amusements. The ship's bells announced each activity change, and the passengers were divided into watches, taking turns as officers of the day. It's Captain, kind of like a well-run primary or a nursery class. Yeah. It, sometimes in church functions, we sort of are treated like little children, huh? Well, this wasn't well, a, really a great sure. idea. I'm just saying it's really great. I, I think this is a great idea to have it so structured going from thing to thing to thing on a regular basis. So your day is divided up into all of these much smaller compartments to make the time pass. Yeah. 
Otherwise, you're bored to death because this isn't a cruise ship. There's no pool on deck. Uh, there's not a lot of fun to be had other than reading those same books over and over again. So Captain Richardson conducted weekly religious services on deck, weather permitting, and each Sabbath at 11 a.m. The meals were mainly consisted of hard tack, which is that middle picture there, kind of a hard cracker, salted meat. So on the top one there is salted pork. And occasionally with variations like apple duff served on Thursday. So every day of the week, you ate things like hard tack and salted pork. And then one day a week, you got kind of a fun surprise of some dessert or some other fun thing of, of sorts, apple duff being the one that they named. And it was the single girls who were responsible for serving the meal on tin dishes. So I thought that was interesting. That's good. You got to have um, the, what is it? The, the vitamin A, ascorbic acid, I can't remember, but the apples in order to ward off scurvy. Yeah. And so that is an important part of the, of the diet. Uh, while living conditions aboard the Brooklyn were strenuous for many, Brannon himself lived lavishly in the ship's officer's quarters. So you'll start to sense as we get through the story, one, Brannon has vitamin C. Brannon has dealt with a lot of trauma early in his life. Abusive father, mm. uh, brother gets sick. I mean, he's got you know illnesses. He gets malaria himself. Um, and then you also will notice that he seems to kind of be a little abrasive to people. He gets things done. But he also is a sort of an abrasive personality. Uh, the ship's company rules. I'm not going to read all of these, but I do want to read the bottom couple. Those who disobeyed the established laws would be expelled. And if the saints, if all the saints broke their covenants, the common property would go to the elders. And if the elders failed, it would pass to the first elder, a.k.a. Samuel Brannan. Yeah. yeah. So he gets to keep everything if, if people can't get along. Um, and they, there were comments in the research that said that these folks were not very happy about the way those rules worked at the end, but they didn't really have much choice. The church had commanded Brandon to lease a ship and come that way, and he was doing his job. So as good Mormons do, uh, we pay, pray, and obey, right? Right. So when they, if they break the established laws and are expelled, does that mean they're walking the plank? Yeah, I don't, I don't see any of that happening. There were a few church disciplinary measures taken, um, and there were some people who went off the plank, but not under the circumstances that, uh, that you just uh, reported. Right. By the way, in so, my defense, I will note that ascorbic, ascorbic acid is vitamin C. Okay, look at that. Both people win. We'll call it a tie. So trials on the ship and then also some issues with death. The drinking water, when, when they didn't get to port on time. Mm. The provisions ran really low and the water got really bad. Again, you've just got lake water from Lake Croton or whatever it was and uh, Crouton. Croton. Cr Crouton. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and the water got really bad it, to the point where the drinking water in the ship became thick and slimy, mm. requiring straining between the teeth and its taste was dreadful. You're making only me hungry. One, only one pint per day was allowed. Thank Rats God. In, Rats infested the vessel, and cockroaches and other vermin plagued the provisions, demanding constant vigilance with every bite. Can you imagine every mm -hmm. bite wanting to be careful that things were not in there that you didn't want to ingest? Yeah, it was um, like when I was a kid and eating trout or something that had the bones in it. And it seemed almost impossible to me to be able to eat this fish with bones in it and not eat the bones too. I'm a little better at it now. Good, good, good. That's what happened. You will get older and we get a little better at those kinds of things. After several trips to the emergency room. <laughs> so uh, Laura Goodwin, this was during the second storm as they were trying to reach, and I'm not going to be able to pronounce it well, but Val Parezo. Um, Laura Goodwin, a pregnant uh, woman traveling with her husband Isaac and seven children, fell down the companionway. Uh, resulting in premature labor and complications. Despite her family's grief, she pleaded not to be buried at sea after lingering passed away eventually because of the storm. They changed course towards Juan Fernandez or Mazatierra, located about 360 uh, miles off the coast of Chile. That's Spanish for Massachusetts. <laughs> no, it's not. The same, <laughs> island where, same island where Robinson Crusoe's story is based. Oh, so wow. that's kind of cool. Yeah. Ten passengers and one crew member lost their lives during the, during the voyage, 
An additional infant passed away at the Sandwich Islands, left behind with their family due to illness. So the family was sick, the kid was sick, and they said, well, sorry, we're going to keep heading to Zion, and they just left them there, but the one kid ended up dying. So they had uh, 10 passengers, one crew. What did they do with Laura Goodwin's body after she pleaded not to be buried at sea? Yeah, so this picture here, you can't see it really well, but this picture here shows a dead body wrapped up laying on the plank. And then what they would do is on the back end, they would pick up the plank and the body would just slide off into the water. And these mm. 10 passengers and one crew member, to the best of my research, were buried at sea, were just dropped off the plank. And it talked about how some of these mothers would lose their kids like in the middle of the night. And rather than have all the public awareness of that, the mother would take her dead child and tr throw him into the water in the in the dark of night rather than deal with all the all the commotion of people talking to her about it. And so there were several babies that they said were buried just by the mother in the in the nighttime uh, mm -hmm. because she didn't want to she didn't want to deal with this with other people uh, being involved. So, you know, these kinds of things, I mean, talking 1800s, taking a voyage on a ship with a lot of people. There's no doubt going to be adversity. There's no doubt going to be some death. Uh, and they said that folks uh, died of things such as diarrhea, scarlet fever, consumption, a cankered sore throat. And that was a child. It was like an eight-month-old or something. So because the throat was so sore, the, the child wouldn't, uh, wouldn't eat and ended up passing away. And dropsy of the stomach. Those were some of the illnesses that folks died from. So they end up uh, finally making land in Juan Fernandez. Uh, the weary passengers swiftly restock the ship with barrels of fish. But because they change ports, this cool thing happens. The port they had gone, they were going to go to, all of the resupplies would have cost them a lot of money. When they go to Juan Fernandez, it's, it's kind of just the locals, and they sort of restock them almost at no charge. So and this so was a tender mercy. Yeah, and they avoided the high cost that were going to be at Valparaiso, which was their first initial plan to stop, making it a suitable second choice destination. After five days, the ship set sail again, and then the second port was Honolulu, Hawaii. Um, which did they go off course there, or was that planned? Um, the first move from Valparaiso to Juan Fernandez was not planned. That was a change that happened because of the storms. The second port in Hawaii, I don't think that was planned either, but I don't remember the specifics of that. I mean, this is but, like Moroni heading out to Manti to dedicate a temple on his way to New York. Yeah. Um, you have to make adjustments. And, and the ship's captain and ship's crew, you'll see by the end, most of the folks in the ship thought they did a really good job. I'll Their bet they did. Port, they showed up in Hawaii and the captain's going, I meant to do this. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I, wouldn't we all want to be... Uh, minus the straining the water through our teeth, we would all like a little stop in Hawaii. Mm, yes. Um, Brandon urged the passengers not to discuss religion with the locals when, when they got to Hawaii. But everybody, as we all know from the kind of the, the stereotype of what happens when you go to Hawaii, they were treated so kindly and such a warm reception that Brandon eventually abandoned that and actually gave a sermon there and uh, it eventually encouraged everybody just to go ahead and be friendly and to be kind rather than kind of keep everything to themselves. So he was worried that if they talked about religion, it might provoke some kind of angry response from the natives? They're the Mormons, and everybody across the world is hearing about the Mormons, and they just didn't want to bring any attention to themselves. Okay. Um, the discipline upon uh, ab aboard the boat, sorry, Samuel Brandon also excommunicated four Mormon passengers for doctrinal errors and moral uh, misconduct. Wow, what do you do when you're stuck on a ship with everybody else, but you're excommunicated? Yeah, I don't know. Like, you don't get to take the sacrament, that's for sure. I don't know about the rest of it. <laughs> Were they using water for the sacrament? Algae water, yeah. Yes, okay. Thick, From Lake thick... Crouton. <laughs> Many of the saints felt he had moved with undue harshness. In fact, uh, somebody said there was rarely an infraction of discipline or decorum among the members of the company, even in the most trying times. And then... Uh, a non-Mormon uh, noted, quote, probably no immigrant a ship ever crossed the ocean. Certainly none ever sailed to California, whose female passengers at the end of a long voyage preserve their reputations as unspotted as those of the Brooklyn. Um, so it was actually a very well-behaved passenger group 
uh, aboard the Brooklyn. And it talks a lot about how the crew was very uh, conduced. They were a very good crew too. Like they were very, um, they, they didn't, they didn't use bad language. They didn't, um, they didn't have any kind of bad behavior. They were a really well-behaved uh, ship's crew as well. And the captain was very respectful towards the passengers and their beliefs. Although, as we pointed out, the religious observances were kind of more of a general Christian hmm. religious service and stuff. And the crew, re- then the crew refrained from singing way, Hey, and up she rises. Yeah, no, right. <laughs> um, so again, the women's, uh, trying to look here the reputations i'm sorry if i threw you off there no no no, you're okay brandon's action uh brandon's actions more deeply estranged him from the other passengers so he's constantly kind of being abrasive to them they kind of see him as ruling with an iron fist a bit and and kind of overreaching uh in terms of his uh treatment of others and being a little harsher than he really needed to be and most people thought essentially the group on the ship were really well behaved um it it made for a, a voyage with very very little misbehavior having to be dealt with. Yerba Buena. Yerba Buena. So they finally, on Friday, July 31st, 1846, the captain, uh, they say the captain had proved to be a skilled navigator. They land in uh, what is now San Francisco Bay. Throughout the trip, John Horner later pointed out, he hit everything, talking about the captain, he hit everything he aimed at and nothing which he did not want to hit. So... The ship essentially okay. went where the captain wanted it to go. That's good. Except By the way, ports. just for a little bit of uh, historical perspective, when, while this is going on, they get to what is today San Francisco in July of 1846. It looks like the last day of July, 1846. It was this very month, I believe, that out in Council Bluffs, Iowa, 500 men of the Mormons became the Mormon Battalion enlisting at the request of the United States government in the U.S. military and began their 2,000-mile march, which would end up with them in San Diego six months later. Yeah, and we're going to talk here about the Mormon Battalion in a moment because they play in in a very separate way with this story. Yeah, because about 100 of them from there head north to Sacramento area. And um, so there's about 100 people from the Mormon battalion who get there in January of 1847 or so, I think it is. Yep. So uh, let's see here. A few. F- so they talk about when they unloaded the ship and start to build a community. It says a few families found vacant homes. Uh, 16 families stayed in the barracks or the customs house, which they separated into apartments using quilt partitions. Others uh, pitched white tents around the village square in military fashion, lit campfires, and set up outdoor cooking facilities. Um, Samuel Brannan settled the remaining debt. They chopped up some uh, redwood to pay the remaining $1,000 that wasn't covered by the initial cost of all the passengers, so they took care of all of their debts. Uh, the Saints had only primitive accommodations and about two months provisions when they started. However, they began building homes, settling uh, up. Uh, go ahead. No, Bodega go ahead. Bay. Bodega Bay, Oahu. Which, uh, yeah, I think uh, what Hitchcock movie is set in Bodega Bay? I don't know. The crows. The, the birds. The birds, yeah. Look I at think that. you were close. I, I, there were crows I was, among those we birds. We talking about the same one. <laughs> yeah, Tippy Hedren. Look at that. I was just guessing. It was either that or uh, what's the one with uh, Psycho? Is that, isn't that an Alfred Hitchcock? I think it's called Psycho. <laughs> yeah, but that's the one. 1960, screenplay by Robert Block, Anthony Perkins, <laughs> etc. Go on. Anthony Perkins. Uh, the Saints had only primitive accommodations for about, in about two months' provisions. They immediately began building homes, setting up industry, laying plans for an agricultural settlement. Brandon took aboard the boat and had this to use an antiquated printing press, which, by the way, that gets him off the on the ground running, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, a complete flour mill to make colonization easier. And they, Brandon goes and asks the locals. He's like, hey, I've got this large group of Mormons. We're going to build a community here. We're going to be here a while. Uh, where should we go? And the locals told him to... Uh, go down by the river and there was a big block of land there that you could use. And so they did, and they called it new hope. And there's the sign uh, today noting the historical establishment of that. 
However, disputes over land and other matters led to the swift failure of New Hope. It, it ended up being just a failed community. Brandon is credited with several firsts in the region, including performing the first non-Catholic wedding ceremony, uh, preaching in English, and establishing the first California public school and flour mill. Brandon founded the California Star as San Francisco's first newspaper, releasing its initial issue on January 9th, 1847. California Star was the second paper in the state following the Californian, founded in Monterey on August 15th, 1846. Both papers merged to become the Daily Alta California in 1848. Brandon sold the California Star to a colleague. So there's a little bit with him and his printing press. By the way, it may be that um, Maven has put her hands on Horatio Alger pictures and Billy Mummy pictures. Is that true, Maven? Hey, Maven, let's just... You it, was, it, it was, but the, I just thought we were long past that. No, so no, no. You, did you delete it accidentally? accidentally? I have a one-track well, mind. I don't you have should just anymore. jump in. <laughs> oh, that's too bad. Okay. Let me go grab them again. Please. I I think it'd be fun to see how right RFM is and seeing how well these folks look. And just this grab, you know, just... Billy Mummy. Yeah, Billy Mummy, Billy Mummy. Yeah, Billy Mummy from the Twilight Zone episode. He was in a few of them, but this is where he was the very bad naughty kid sending people into the cornfield when he didn't like them. Yeah, I, folks, I'm sorry. I've got a one track mind, Maven. I often Is it the cornfield or the corn patch? It's one or the other. Anyway, Children of the a, Corn. It's a beautiful life, something like that. That might have been the name of the episode. So when Brandon goes to California, he believes that he is going to establish the location where the saints are going to meet up. <clears throat> oh, it looks like here we got this is Horatio Alger. Let's go back here. Oh, maybe he was the author. He was the author of all the stories about the rags to riches stories, the young men who worked hard and became successes. Oh, it says rags to riches right there. Let's see here. So Horatio Alger. This is one of his young protagonists in the bottom. Okay. And now Billy Mummy. From that episode. Oh, well, I'm sorry. Please, it. Maven, if you don't mind. <laughs> yeah, and as you said, while Maven's looking, it's interesting because he gets to California. He's got no idea. He knows that Brigham Young has left Illinois, right? But he's, he doesn't know that he with... stopped in, yeah. um, you know, BFE. He thought he'd probably go all the way west to California. There he is. Oh, yeah. Spitting image. There's Billy Mummy. He's sending somebody into the corn patch right now. You're a Billy bad Mummy. man. All right, let me go back to this slide here. Thank you, Maven. Thank you, Maven. You're a gem. I'm super sorry for dropping the ball there. Damn. Tension with LDS leadership. So as we're talking about, Brandon goes to California. He thinks this is, he's going to create the, the place for the saints. He thinks this is the place. Yes. And he doesn't know that they're going to Texas to check out that locale. He doesn't know that Brigham Young's going to get tired of traveling in a wagon and decide to stop short of the final destination and declare that Utah is where they're going to be. And California, it just, it's more set up to be the right place. The, the Great Salt Lake is not that great of a body of water. Uh, the Great Salt Lake region is really not uh, apt to uh, growing crops and doing other things there. And it really isn't the best location. But when the prophet speaks, the speaking has been the right. The thinking has been done. I think the story is there was one tree in the entire valley when the saints arrived. In the Salt Lake Valley. Yeah. Yeah. So that means you got to go places and bring other things and... Uh, it makes everything a little more difficult. So in June of 1847, Brannon goes to the Green River in Wyoming to meet with Brigham Young. And Brannon urges Young to bring the Mormon pioneers to California. He's already got a settlement established. It's already ready to be home. So he goes over to see Brigham Young, who's with the first train of Mormons heading out to the Salt Lake Valley. They have not arrived there yet because... That's July 24th of 1847, and this is June, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, Brigham 
declines, says, no, we're going to settle. We're going to settle in Utah. So that somehow that decision in some way has already been made. Brandon returns to Northern California. Wait, 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 wait. You mean this isn't a revelation that Brigham Young gets when he stands up in his wagon, sick from the Rocky Mountain fever, sees the valley and says, this is the right place. All I know is that Samuel Brannon left in June of 1847 to visit Brigham Young and meets him at the Green River in Wyoming and urges Young to come to uh, San Francisco and Young declines and Brannon returns to Northern California frustrated. So it sounds like Brigham Young may have already made up his mind before he got to the Salt Lake Valley. That seems to be what the story indicates, but I will leave room for Dan Vogel or some other folk in the uh, chat to correct us. Uh, many members stopped paying Brandon because Brandon was collecting the tithing from members mm. the entire time. So obviously there's not a lot of money being made on a boat, so tithing isn't happening there. But the moment they land and start producing industry, uh, Brandon, being the leader of the group, collects tithing money. And as members are learning that the main block of the Mormons are going to be in Utah, lots of these folks stop paying their tithing and begin to make preparations and make themselves uh, start to move themselves towards back to the main body of the saints. And, uh, but not everybody goes. And there's two accounts of what happens when the church tries to deal with Samuel Brannon's having collected the tithing. And the first one's one I've heard for years and years, but when Lyman, this is when uh, um, Amasa Lyman uh, went to Samuel Brannon to collect the tithing money that Brannon had collected from the saints that he was responsible for. When Lyman arrived, Brannon was unable to account for the tithes that Brigham Young and other Mormons claimed were given to him or that he owed from his own personal income. He reportedly told Amas uh, Amasa, you go back and tell Brigham Young that I'll give up the Lord's money when he sends me a receipt signed by the Lord. And I always loved that quote for different reasons, because when I was a believing Mormon, this was one of the worst apostates I'd ever read of was Samuel Brannon, who stole the Lord's money. And I saw him as an apostate. And what he did, I certainly don't think is appropriate. If he was collecting money on behalf of the church, then the ethical thing to do is to turn that money over. But there is something about standing up to uh, an LDS prophet that I sort of get a kick out of. Mm, having done that in your recent past, a yeah. Mr. Real. Yeah. You know, it, it, I think both, I think you and me and a lot of other people do that in various ways by creating content and, and letting the church know that sometimes they're not behaving nicely. Um, in another account, Lyman was sent to get, and this is another reporting of what happened. And this one differs from the one we just read in another account. Lyman was sent to gather $10,000 of owed tithing from Brannon or more if he was willing and after a couple of visits, all of Brandon's debts to the LDS church were considered to be paid in full. By the way, Will Bagley, good, solid LDS historian, uh, says that he doesn't believe the first story is true. I didn't, couldn't find his opinion on the second. But there is some, again, legends out there about whether Brandon paid that back or not with a little bit of spite. Um, so, And then I want to turn some time over to you to talk for a moment. You mentioned earlier the Mormon Battalion. Give us a little more information on them, what their trip was, and then we'll move into the discovery of gold in California. Right. So here we have a nice map. Thank you for finding this, Bill. You see there in Council Bluffs. So the Mormons have left Illinois February, I think it was, of 1846 when the Mississippi was frozen over so they could roll their wagons across the river. Then they had a hell of a time making it through Iowa because of weather and mud. And they'd gotten as far as Council Bluffs in July of 1846. So that took a long time, if you can imagine, from February to July to go across the state of Iowa, especially when you compare it with the 111 days it takes to get from winter's quarters out to the Salt Lake Valley. So that was a long, arduous trip. They got to Council Bluffs. Representatives of the United States come out and say, we need some men for the, to join the United States Army. And they were provided 500 Mormon men. Brigham Young's um, motives were probably more pragmatic than patriotic. I don't think he had a lot of love for the U.S. military or the 
the United States as of this point in church history. However, the military members got paid by the United States government in hard cash. And so that was something that was helpful because then they could get paid. That could go and be sent back to the Mormons once they got wherever they were going to get. And we know now it was in Salt Lake Valley. That was very helpful to them. They, they were cash poor. They were strapped. So this was a godsend. So there's around 500 men in the Mormon battalion. There were 40 some odd women, maybe 30 some odd kids who went with them as well. And they end up taking this path out to San Diego, which was, of course, when they left part of Mexico. By the time they get there six months later, that's the red dot here going south through Kansas, then down through New Mexico, and then over through Arizona out to San Diego. And then it has this going up to Los Angeles. San Diego, I'm pretty sure, is where their destination was. And by the time they got there six months later, the fighting was pretty much over. So around 400 of the 500 headed up to Utah, but 100 headed north to Sacramento area. That's that blue line. And they went up there, uh, one account says to find family members. I don't know if those are people who were on the Brooklyn. That strikes me as a little strange that that would be the case. It's possible. But the other thing is that they went up there to earn money. Then they could take that money. Then they could head east from Sacramento out to Salt Lake. Once again, it was sort of up in the air and news was getting out as to where the Mormons were actually going to put up shop. It's just a historical thing now that it was Salt Lake. But then it was not known until they found out. So they go up there to the Sacramento area and it's 1848. There's um, a number of them that find out there's a mill that is being built by a couple of guys named Marshall and Sutter. So it's famously known as Sutter's Mill. In January, was it the 27th of 1848, Bill? That, that, gold, right. that gold is discovered Yeah. at Sutter's Mill. <clears throat> It's January of 1848, and there are Mormons who are present there. They write about it in their journals, and this, of course, is the beginning of the great California gold rush. So you've got the Mormon battalion coming up through this incredible 2,000-mile march, and 100 of them or so end up in the same area that Samuel Brannon is in, where he's established shop there, having sailed all the way from New York down under Cape Horn and all the way up via Hawaii, and landing in around the same area. Yep. And so uh, gold is discovered. And then just like a month later, two Mormons, like you said, record it in their journals and, and they're uh, credited with finding some gold. And the two Mormons were Henry Bigler and Azariah Smith. And they are the uh, top row of people there in the picture that's on the screen right now. And so those two guys are near Sutter's Mill they're part of this whole initial gold find. And this ends up working fantastically for Samuel Brannan's story because in 1847, right around the same time, Brannan opens up a store at Sutter's Fort in Sacramento. A few months later, just as we reported, rumors circulated that gold had been found nearby at Coloma. In early May, Brannan headed to the mines to see for himself. He learned that there was more gold than all the people in California could take out in 50 years. Brannon made plans for a second store. He then packed up some of the precious metal into a quinine bottle and traveled the 100 miles back to San Francisco. As he stepped off the ferry, Brannon swung his hat, waved the bottle, and shouted, gold, 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 gold from the American River. And by the middle of June, three quarters of the male population had left town for the mines. But see, he had a store there, and Brandon being no dumb guy, he decided that he would uh, buy up all of the mining supplies and then mark them up exponentially. And this is how he made most of his fortune. Uh, he resold the gold at a substantial profit and used the proceeds to purchase all available mining supplies in San Francisco reselling the mining tools at an exponential profit, making a staggering $36,000 in just nine weeks. He eventually opened a third store. His stores made enormous profits by selling as much as $5,000, about $120,000 in 2005 uh, currency in 
Uh, I can't read that word there, Maven. In, in goods, goods per day. Sorry, goods per day to the miner. Sorry about that. So 5000 bucks a day, which would be yeah. around $120,000, uh, what, 18 years ago? <laughs> Heaven only knows what it would be, like $140,000, $150,000 today. Yeah. He's making every day in yeah. his three stores. He was really smart about how he did this. Yeah. Uh, in 1848, Brandon focused on de uh, developing California's connection with the East by establishing the California Star Express, delivering mail from San Francisco to Independence, Missouri. He expanded his business with more stores, selling goods to miners, and accumulating substantial wealth. What is his connection with the church at this time? Do you know, Bill? Um, he's he's disciplined. Uh, we'll get to it here in a moment. He's disciplined later. But it's it, there's tensions there for sure, but it seems like he might still be in the church at this point. Um, Brannon's involvement in land speculation caused tensions. It led to a famous squatters riot in 1850 in which nine people were killed, and Brannon was considered the instigator of the incident. And so, again, here's Brannon kind of being abrasive, uh, hard to get along with. This is also not a real photo of Brannon sitting with his millions of dollars. Um, this is a AI, our, uh, AI picture that took a picture of Samuel Brandon and put him in an image with a million dollars. Despite facing financial setbacks, Brandon became California's first millionaire. First millionaire around 1850. That's insane. Uh, he served on the San Francisco's first town council. He was elected as senator to the California State Senate in Sacramento. To advance uh, westward settlement, Brandon purchased California's first steam locomotive. But here's where we get to it. However, his actions as a leader of the vigilantes from the squatters riot in 1851 and, uh, and his kind of tensions with LDS leadership led to his disfellowshipment from the LDS church on August 25th, 1851. Hmm. Um, but man, he had already made his name in the history books. And when you go read up on Samuel Brannan, they'll talk about the Mormon background and the in the sailing on the on the Brooklyn and all of that. But it is his being involved in the gold rush and capitalizing on that, but making so much money off of it, buying and then turning that money into uh, property purchases in San Francisco and Sacramento. Uh, you're talking about California's very first millionaire. And then we'll get here to the abrupt uh, decline of Samuel Brannan. Um, let me do two seconds here. Okay, so uh, it said that... So I'm guessing he wasn't paying tithing on this. Uh, no, he he wasn't paying tithing on this. No, not at all. Well, bad things uh, are bound to happen, Bill. That's true. Bad. <laughs> that's true. Um, I need to get into the call-in studio, which I'll do here in a second, but I'm hoping... Uh, at some point, I need to kind of sneak off of this for a second to do that. But who is this uh, lovely lady in the picture? This is his second wife. And uh, here's what happened. So first off, poorer residents in Calistoga opposed Brandon's takeover. This led to intense opposition. And it finally gets to the point where people are committing violence against him. In this one incident, he is shot eight times, although he survives. Jeez. In, in 1870, his uh, second wife, Anna Eliza Corwin, she divorces Brannon in the court system rules uh, that she was entitled to half of their holdings in cash. And so Brannon, having his million dollars in land property, yeah. had to sell a ton of his real estate to fulfill the settlement. But he did. Uh, he did do that. And then we get to the death of Samuel Brannon. <clears throat> After his divorce, Brannon became a brewer but developed an alcohol problem because of that. That will he happen. Left, yep. He left San Francisco, settled in Mexico near the border of Sonora. Hmm. Um, President Benito Juarez, which you might remember that name from the third convention episodes that we did. Yes. And so Benito Juarez uh, paid him uh, some money for helping to expel the Frenchmen from the area. And in 1888, at the age of 69, he received $49,000 in interest from the Mexican government he uses that to pay off all of his debts, but he is dirt poor at this point, to the point where in 1887, Brandon is selling pencils door to door to raise money in San Francisco. You know or something? Sorry, for a trip to San Francisco. Um, one thing that comes up over and over is that he does seem to have integrity. Uh, I know this is a, a 30,000 view, 
But I just see him over and over paying debts, paying the debts that he owed, get, obtaining money through some means and then using it to pay debts. Yeah, Brandon seems to take care of things. Um, yes. And again, that's why when Will Bagley says he doesn't believe the first story, my hunch is that Brandon, being as rich as he was, figured out a way to pay $10,000 to get because he remains in the church for a little longer. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's really the squatters riot that really plays a major role in his getting disfellowshipped. So it seems on some level, the church wasn't uber annoyed with him. Um, and so certainly some room there, I think uh, to, to understand that Brandon as harsh as he was at times seems to be the kind of person who does pay off his debts because being in California, the divorce happens. We're in the mid 1850s. It's not like the modern world where, you can really get chased down as easily uh, to pay such things back, I would assume, right? I mean, do you have any idea what the kind of what what kind of uh, way in which the legal system would have to get debts secured in the 1850s? No. Yeah. No, I don't know. But I think that a lot of people people. could avoid it, would avoid mm -hmm. it, would not cash out their ex-wife for half of the amount that was ordered that he be given her. Right. So perhaps Samuel Brannan was a Lannister at heart, Bill. You know what Tyler they say about Lannister. Lannisters? Yeah, one out of three ain't bad. A Lannister always pays his debts. Yes. Game of Thrones. Did you watch Game of Thrones? Three times. All, the, the entire series, three times. Yes. It took me wow. that long to sort of begin to understand what the heck was going on. <laughs> There's so many characters I, to keep yeah. track of. I've watched it like through season three and only once and that's it really I watched it, I watched it up until where the dragon eggs were given to the white-haired uh young lady that was an important role in the in the show <laughs> yes See, that, yes yeah that's as far as i got okay well a lot happens after that just so you know yeah i'll have to i'll have to tune back in same thing with breaking bad i watched episode number one and then gave it up. My wife and I were like, mm, I don't know if I like that. And then we came back to it a year or two later and then fell in love with it and watched the whole thing. Hmm. Okay. Well, great. I haven't seen any of those. But regardless of our TV watching habits, do you yeah. have a picture of a pencil up here? Yeah. So Brandon in 1887 sold pencils door to door to raise money for a trip to San Francisco. One reporter described him. Again, remember, this is California's first millionaire in 1850. Mm. Uh, the reporter described him as old, gray, broken in strength, able only to get about with the aid of a cane. The old keenness of the eye alone shows that his spirit has survived the decay of his body. Mm. Um, he stopped drinking right at the end of his life. And uh, I'm actually going to put the telephone number up, 662-667. He must have had to sell a lot of pencils to finance that trip. Yeah, I don't know if they were number twos or what they were. Certainly weren't mechanical pencils. But uh, Are we back to number two again? And thus we two. see that the course of the Lord is one eternal round. Yeah. He stopped drinking right at the end of his life, and Brandon died at 70 years old on a small fruit farm outside of San Diego in Escondido, California, on May 5th, 1889, leaving his children but a few dollars apiece hmm. and without enough money to cover his funeral. His body actually went unclaimed in the San Diego County receiving vault until recognized by chance. Brandon was given a Christian burial at Mount Hope Cemetery, where a stake initially marked his grave. And so I've got the uh, grave, the current uh, tombstone there, gravestone there. And then I, I put it together a couple pictures. And by the way, folks, call in. We've got the call-in studio open. So if you want to uh, add any insights or any questions on good old Samuel Brannan. But Samuel Brannan had a bank. Uh, and then in that picture, I think this actually is the bank, that middle top picture. And it said that it was Brannan standing on the right in the doorway. And so that very far right person, not close enough to see anything, but that is supposed to be Samuel Brannan. Down below is the historical marker for the Sam Brannan store where Brannan uh, resold all of the mining supplies and the newspaper from the California, which Brannan had a part in the newspaper announcing the gold rush. And again, having a general store that sold mining supplies and having 
uh, ownership of the press that could report on the gold rush was deeply beneficial to Samuel Brandon being able to get the word out. And then the other newspaper there, the California star with a little picture of, uh, of Samuel Brannan. And then uh, conclusion, American historian uh, Hubert Howe Bancroft describing Brannan's achievements, quote, he probably did more for San Francisco and for other places than was affected by the combined eff efforts of scores of better men. And indeed, in many respects, he was not a bad man. Being a, as a rule straightforward as well as shrewd in his dealings, as famous for his acts of charity and open-handed li uh, liberality, uh, as for an enterprise giving also frequent proofs of personal bravery. And a couple of little notes, California cities that claim Brandon as their founder include Calistoga and Yuba City. And in partnership with John Augustus Sutter Jr. and with William Tecumseh Sherman and Edward Ord as surveyors, Brannon laid out the unofficial subdivisions that became the city of Sacramento. He was the author of the forever known shout, Gold, 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 uh, which created one of the biggest migrations of people around the world to a small state the world knows as California. And Brannon Street in San Francisco was named after Samuel Brannon. And there's a really cool picture with Brannon being the top, the person in the top right. But these were folks that were involved in business there in California at the height of Samuel Brannon's uh, wealth and notoriety. That is very, very nice. What a great presentation, Bill. I'm still waiting for a street to be named Radio Free Mormon in downtown Salt Lake City. You know, there may be a day, someday, there may be such a thing that happens. That would be kind of cool, wouldn't it? I'd like that. Yeah. <laughs> maybe instead of North Temple. Yeah, you know, maybe someday that temple will go for sale too and they won't need it anymore. You know something? It, it just may be that at the next general conference in October, the church may announce that they have purchased the Kirtland Temple. That could happen. You think maybe you could get a street there in Ohio? There's a story about that. It's sort of hush, hush, whisper, whisper, but it could happen. It could. So but, if it does happen, rumors, remember you heard it here. Those were rumors when you and I were young in the church too, though, wasn't it? Yeah, but the church didn't have as much money to tempt the reorganites. No. They have community of, of Christ now. covenant. And when you've got that much money, you got to find things to spend it on. Or yeah, not. and you can make an offer. Other people can't refuse. That was no. terrible. Would you do that for me? <laughs> Would you do your Marlon Brando? Uh, make him an offer. Make him an offer. May he have a masculine child. Make him an offer. refuse. All right. So uh, that's the end of my show uh, in terms of sharing this history on Samuel Brandon. I really appreciate you adding some things on the Mormon battalion in the gold rush. Uh, it's one of these stories in Mormonism I think is sort of cool that very few people know about. And uh, sorry for kind of the the rambling through it, but I wanted to put a bunch of pictures up and make sure that this all guy, the information got shared. This, you said the guy on the right of this picture who's standing, that's Samuel Brandon? That's Samuel Brandon, the top right of that photo, yes. You see the guy who's on the bottom right? I've seen I that. Face before. I swear to you, yeah. that's Tom Cruise. <laughs> Is that when he's got the, the, the mask on from Mission Impossible or no, something? No, no, that's Tom Cruise. That's without the mask. The guy's uncanny. <laughs> that looks like Willard Richards in the bottom middle, isn't it? <laughs> in the bottom middle, it's either that or Larry from the Three Stooges. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ichabod Crane there in the top left. and uh, Yes. Very it's good. Like my dad there in the bottom left, I think. So I think we've accounted for everybody. <laughs> well, we do have a call. Anything else from you before we go to a few phone calls and then we'll uh, we'll call it a night. No, I'd love to hear what the callers have to say, Bill. Okay, let's do that. All right. So uh, this is going to be Captain Moroni. Ooh. Captain Moroni, are you there? Yes. All right. Yes, can you hear me? Yeah, you're on Mormonism Live. What's on your mind, oh. my friend? Awesome. First off, got to say thanks for everything y'all do. Y'all are amazing. Y'all hear it all the time. It never gets old because it's real. Um, yeah, this is Captain Marona. I'm actually calling from 22 North Radio Free Mormon Street from Bill Rillsville right now. So it, we, you wouldn't believe it. I, uh, I won't believe you until you show me your banner of liberty. Yeah. Yeah, well, 
you're just going to have to go by faith rather than by sight. You you're, know this is how I work. You're not you the thing about me. You're not the January sixth Captain Moroni. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. But um, <laughs> you don't. You shouldn't need to be so so vision based with your faith and belief in me. Yeah. So shame I think he got that. taken out of commission, and this um, was a battlefield promotion. Go ahead, Captain Moroni. I can't help but notice that the um, folks like Samuel Brandon, amazing about being first millionaire in California, and um, the way that he was the leader of the church, and um, it, it's amazing to me. I, kind of this this curriculum based on there's an intense need, and we have the solution here, and these type of people seem to shine in the church or in these organizations, and um, which is interesting because now we're at a spot where we're not promoting innovators, but we we promote the manage, managerial types, the obedient managers. But maybe if we stuck to the ways of having the Samuel Brandons and the Joseph Smiths, we would definitely have a lot more revelation and excitement. I mean, sure, we'd have some things to be pointed at, but um, it's just an observation I make. A great episode, great work. I'm going to clear the line for other callers, but I can't thank you enough. You, you've given me my life back, and um, it was never terrible for me, but I... I can see so much more now that I could never see before. Awesome. So thanks, fellas, for all your work. Thank you. Have a great day, my friend. Thank you so much. Yeah. That reminds me of something, if you're still listening or if you're still there, something David Thoreau wrote. What was it? Um, now I'm going to try and do this one again. Uh, that um, there's nothing that is of a greater joy, that's not the right introduction, than to have an unobstructed vista. Now that is really bad. But it's something like that, right? And it's like when you said that um, your life wasn't so bad before, but now you can see things that you couldn't see before. Yeah, absolutely. That's certainly enjoyable to me, and I'm glad to hear it is to you. By the way, Bill, do you remember those good old days when our technology was such that I could not communicate with listeners? Yeah, in the very first phone call system. <laughs> in fact, it has a lot to do with why Maven is here. Is because in the original system... I could talk to the callers, you couldn't, and you had to just wait until I uh, got all the information from them, and then you could say it, and then if I, if they needed to know what you said, I had to relay it. It was a right. little bit of a pain in the butt. That, that went on forever. That was when I learned American <laughs> Sign Language. Yeah. Um, I noticed, by the way, Captain Moroni spoke with like a Southern accent, not really a Reformed Egyptian accent. That was, I, I kind of expected Captain Moroni to have a different accent than that. Well, there you go. You see, yeah. I was surprised about Massachusetts and Maine. You're surprised about Captain Moroni's accent. <laughs> yeah. And by the way, Captain Moroni, if you're the same Captain Moroni who donated a few bucks in the chat earlier, I want to say thank you very much. Uh, it, obviously, donations are a big part of what we do. Uh, please, folks, go to mormonismlive.org. Click the donate button. Send a few bucks this way. Joan Galloway just sent in a $10 super sticker. We very much appreciate that. Um, donations is how we do it. We're a nonprofit, 501c3, and that's how we uh, how we survive. So um, that's the only call in the call phone bank. Uh, there's Captain so Moroni is it. Yeah, he's it. Uh, there's no Alma, no Nephi in the in the phone call system. Uh, any other thoughts from you? Otherwise, we could just shut her down and call it a good night. We got out of here at 736 tonight. Look at that. That is almost unprecedented. You know, the funny thing, Bill, is I'll just tell stories for another couple please, of hours to please, fill out the ahead. time. Let's no, go to, the, let's go to <laughs> the funny thing is, is that that was actually the plan. If any of you remember back two and a half years ago when we started this Mormonism Live thing, that was the plan. We'll do about an hour, right? Hour max. Mm -hmm. And then we take some phone calls and we'd uh, say goodbye. But that has sort of expanded over time. Yeah, mainly because a lot of these historical stories that we tell or the conversations around current events or the interviews that we have, it really does take a two or, th you know, sometimes three hours, but two hours to get through them. I mean, when you look at the things we did with like uh, uh, the, the Corden uh, kid in that whole episode, yeah. uh, things that we've done in terms of we interviewed uh, Lindsay Hansen Park and went through all the problematic stories in polygamy. Um, Telling these kinds of tales takes some time. And so I think we've gotten to the point where we go about an hour and 45 minutes to two and a half hours or so. You know who I haven't heard enough from tonight? Maven. Yes. 
Maven from the Antipodes. How are you doing? Well, I just don't always have reliable sound, so um, sounds good right now. For the chat to say it does sound good. Okay, the show is yours, Maven. Well, I, <laughs> well, I don't have much to add. I've I've been enjoying it and laughing in the background at the random references and things. And this is a story I I just, I just known very extremely vaguely. I knew that a ship. I, I knew that some Mormons had ended up in San Francisco and wanted the rest of the church to come and that there was kind of a split with those that didn't end up going back to Salt Lake. But um, yeah, I don't I don't really have much to add this time. So we really can keep it short, like a, an early Mormonism live, unless you want to tell more stories. <laughs> oh, um, Hmm. <laughs> We lost our FM. It's it is a stupor of thought. Sorry, I was typing and I muted myself to type. There we go. Which I I try to do, but sometimes fail to do, and then you hear me typing. Click clack. Click clack. You know, I actually have my keyboard. <laughs> Let me start it again. I type so fast <laughs> that I have my keyboard specially made out of asbestos, so it doesn't burst into flame. True that story. Sounds, uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, I, I'm going to say good night and, <laughs> and remove myself from the screen. <laughs> okay, well, it's great seeing you, Maven. Bye-bye. It's no secret anymore that Maven's in India, is it? Uh, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I Did hope it, not. As of three seconds ago, no. No, I think that's pretty much out there. And so hopefully she'll be rejoining us in the... Um, the states in the not too distant future. Yeah. Oh. Um, oops, oh, look at that! You're Jim, Jim Bennett. Bennett now. <laughs> yeah, it'll be about another month. Um, I'll be. Uh, I'll take a quick little detour in the UK um, when I'm done here, and uh, yeah, it's coming up. I'll be back in the states soon. Great. Can Just we? hop on the Brooklyn. <laughs> I don't think. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> what? <clears throat> Just a rough, it was a rough Thanks, voyage, everybody. Right? I'm <laughs> the episode's over. Okay. I'm right. I'm by the way, ahead. by the way, where Maven is, is 12 and a half hours ahead of where I am in my undisclosed time zone. So right there, it should be 10 minutes after 7 o'clock in the morning on Thursday. Yeah. Is that right, Maven? That's correct. Wow. Yes. What is the most interesting or exciting thing that's happened to you during your adventure living in India? I, I don't know, guys. <laughs> I don't. I don't. I don't have anything interesting to share off the top of my head, so I'd rather not um, <laughs> say something boring. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> More than I already have. All right. All right. Well, we'll be I'll interviewing you later later. about your time in India. Okay. Yeah. Your your next week's Mormonism Live. No, we've got something really cool for next week, so there's mm. no way um, I would want to miss that. So. No, as next far, week. As far as the current plan is. Yeah, yeah. Isn't By the way, week? just really quick. Yeah, next week we're going to have a huge show. bombshell. It's going to be an expose. You don't want to miss it. Mm. As much as you would Impressive. not have wanted to miss this scintillating conversation about Samuel Brandon and the Brooklyn. Okay. Current events, bombshell, new stuff. Please don't miss it. Next Wednesday on July 26th, right? It's the 19th 26th. today, so it's the 26th yeah. next. Wednesday, same bad time, same bad channel.